Bonjour, thank you very much everyone from, welcome from the Global South. I'm Andres Kipani, I'm the East and Central Africa correspondent with the Financial Times, based in Nairobi right now. And we are in the midst of a crisis. We know that in the Global South, I'm Latin American, I was born in Argentina, so we are used to crisis, but this is a very different crisis. And so we knew, so more or less we're getting to know what's going on with the virus. We know the health impacts. And we've seen a lot of what's happening in the Northern economies uh, and the most developed economies with, 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 with the economic hardship from COVID-19. But now to discuss what's happening, which lessons we have learned, what else we need to do when it comes to emerging economies, we have a stellar panel of friends here, three former world bankers, Karim Elanoui, and Ottaviano Canuto and Celeste Monge. Thank you very much. And thank you all of you who are on the, whatever you are in the world for listening to this. I hope this is gonna be very, very fruitful. And as I said before, so essentially this is a new kind of crisis. Uh, we know probably the world economy is gonna shrink over 5%. Uh, and we saw in the developed world, in the, in the most advanced economies, how at the beginning, central banks put a lot of gunpowder into, into rolling out stimulus. <clears throat> we, have, we saw the US, China, which in a way it benefited some countries in, in the developing world, like sucking in uh, commodities like iron ore and soya from Brazil, for example. But we saw all sorts of different approaches to how to tackle the economic hardship from the COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, as we know better than I do, uh, central banks in the emerging markets don't have the same amount of canned powder. So they resorted to whatever they could be able to do. Uh, <clears throat> but all of this has also got us into sort of like familial territories uh, for Latin America and for Africa, especially like new levels of debt distresses, fiscal, fiscal cliffs approaching, I mean, look at the case of Brazil, where, for example, we are reaching like over 90% of GDP when it comes to debt ratios. Uh, but Karim, let me start with you, and not because just you are, you are the host, so thank you very much for having me here again. It's always a pleasure to be involved with the Policy Center for New South, but also because you're a former central banker. So we saw very eclectic, let's say, approaches from central banks. Uh, what, what, what consequences are we going to see now, be it for asset prices, uh, I mean, rate of returns across sectors? We, I mean, we've seen like record low uh, interest rates by now. Is this here to stay? Is the model of this is the end? I mean, in Brazil, for example, a couple of years ago, we had interest rates at 16%. Today, we are record low of 2% below inflation, which is now at over 4%. So is this the, infl the end of the model of inflation targeting? In the, in the emerging markets? Uh, thank you, Andres, and a pleasure to be with, uh, with friends in this, uh, in this panel. It's a real, uh, real pleasure. Uh, well, let me tell you that uh, there's a strong debate ongoing. Of course, as you mentioned, uh, due to the crisis, uh, you know, countries had to manage, and uh, you know, in general, with short-term crisis of this nature, uh, where you have to support the liquid the, the economy and particularly you know provide liquidity and to have you know a continuation of credit market and the liquid and the short term liquidity markets for financial agents so central bank have stepped in uh, and uh, like in 2008 uh, in the same sort of uh, of spirit uh, at the same time let's not remember let's remember that we have not fully recovered in a way uh, from the 2008 crisis uh, in terms of uh, sort of orthodox monetary policy. And there is a tendency those days to believe that interest rate will, be, will remain low forever and just get debt and you'll grow faster than the debt and this will all be fine. I think we have to be careful. Uh, uh, you, we, when you, you control short-term interest rate as a central bank, but you don't control long-term interest rate, uh, where they are the, the dynamics of bondholders uh, uh, and, and the view of the future and expectations integrated in there. So let's not fool ourselves thinking we will control interest rate across all maturities forever 
and then we can say, okay, you know, the fisc the public sector can get debt and they will invest and get, uh, you know, uh, rates of returns that will be higher than the rate of, uh, of the interest rate, and this will be sustainable. First of all, let's make sure that this money is spent in countries where you can afford to have expansionary uh, fiscal policy because interest rates are low. If you take Morocco, for instance, we just borrowed around 1.5% uh, you know, on the euro bond market, which is very low. For a country like Morocco that grows on average over a cycle, you know, 10, 15 years, about three percentage points per capita per year, which is quite high compared to an interest rate of 1.5 uh, 1 or even a little bit lower. So it would make sense. The question is what you do with this money. Uh, uh, of course, you manage short term, you can support demand. But what is important is that you invest in infrastructure, you increase the capital stock, you generate productivity gain, that will translate in higher wages, and that make it sustainable. But this is not a bet that is win, that you win from the onset. It is complex to do. It's not easy. So my uh, here, I would say my warning is that we have to be very careful not to throw all Keynesian economics uh, that uh, we've uh, we've learned. There is still a sound theory, uh, you know, for uh, for interest rates. There are still expectations. There are still also arbitrage of economic agents, uh, you know, saving and investing their savings for their pensions, particularly in Europe, where the demographics, uh, the demographic dynamics we know, but also, you know, alternative rates of returns across sector, across assets that economic agents are based, are using to base their decision on. So I don't think it is, the debate is as simple as it is when I hear for countries like Morocco, or older, you mentioned Brazil, this is about helicopter money, let's monetize the debt, let's put a perpetual debt on the balance sheet of the central bank, we will see when we reimburse it, and at some point, let's say, raise it, so you have, you know, sort of uh, expansionary uh, uh, increase of the monetary base versus increase of uh, excess reserve, which what you do when you do quantitative easing, but which is still better frame, there are still assets in front of what you do, in a way. So I can come back to that. But my message is really, let us not, in emerging markets, let us be careful, let us still monitor the debt ratio, let us be uh, wise in the kind of investment we do on the basis of this low interest rate that allow us to have expansionary monetary policy. Let's invest in education, in the future, in investment, etc. versus, of course, supporting the hardship and through social safety net of households and workers that have been suffering. But let's have an eye on that, productivity, etc. That's what matters in the long run. That would be my main message at this stage. Let us not be sort of carried away by the debate in the US between secular stagnation, structural sort of definitive structural moment where interest rate doesn't don't matter anymore. Uh, I, you know, you can read the debate between Summers, Fruman, and, uh, uh, and, and Galbraith on that. I don't think for emerging market, this is something uh, that, uh, uh, that is, uh, you know, that is very relevant, that is a good uh, sort of orientation for policy policy making. Uh, I can come back to that, and particularly on the, fis the coordination between monetary and fiscal policy, uh, which uh, and, in the, and the autonomy independence of central bank that I think is an important issue uh, that has been raised by this crisis. Thank you very much, Karim. And actually, on that point, I want to go back to you, Karim, on that exact point, because I wanted to to ask Otavian, especially, I mean, we saw different, I mean, so let, let, let's call it a, an eclectic mix of, of how central banks across emerging markets have responded. I mean, Ghana, for example, have lower reserve requirements and engaged in a public bonds purchasing program, South Africa, I mean, easing liquidity conditions, purchasing government securities and so on. But then one debate, Otaviano, in your own country, that, by the way, I was a correspondent in Brazil until recently, so, but still stick close to my heart. Uh, one debate right now, Otto Viano, is what, what is going to happen to a bill to give the central bank independence. It seems it has been put in the freezer, but this goes along uh, with Karim's point about this separation, let's say, of church and state, of between fiscal and monetary policy. 
are central banks being allowed to be independent that they should, uh, many people think they should be in the current conditions? Uh, look, uh, in the case of Brazil, uh, uh, the, uh, the emergency package even included an authorization for the central bank of Brazil uh, to buy private assets. The option has been not doing that. Uh, Karim made an important point, which must be kept in mind, which is the following. Uh, quantitative easing is a deceiving name because it is not geared that necessarily easing. Uh, some, uh, a colleague of mine prefers to call it uh, quantitative stabilizing because the idea is that you have the central bank uh, diminishing fluctuations, avoiding the instability, avoiding situations of illiquidity in, in the several uh, 10 years of, of the asset market, especially in the case of advanced economies, because they have, uh, let's say, density in, in, the, in the asset uh, 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 pile and so on. And, and okay, uh, of course, the stabilization reduces the, the, the risk premium associated with liquidity, but quantitative easing is not necessarily to force uh, uh, the price of assets to come down their, their fundamentals, because otherwise uh, the country uh, runs the risks that uh, Karim was mentioning of, uh, you know, at, at the base there will be the, the investors who look at, who gauge risks and, 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 uh, and, and have to be, you, you don't deceive them by using central bank measures. This is different from monetization of public debt. Now, uh, in the case of, of uh, emerging markets, there was some use of quantitative stabilizing or easing, or however you want to call it. But we must keep in mind that they were very short and they were geared exactly at avoiding the instability uh, on, on longer term assets. That's the case of Chile, Poland, and others, who uh, countries that, by the way, were facing uh, at, at the time, uh, interest rates equal to zero, close to zero. That is to say they were operating just like advanced economies. This should be kept in mind. There was another group of uh, emerging markets like India and others who didn't have zero interest rate, but did some experiment. But this is to be differentiated from, from, from for instance, two other countries that used the central bank to monetize the issuance of public debt. So quantitative easing or quantitative stabilizing is no magic wand. There's not something that you one can count on, on, on pulling and, and saving us from uh, uh, any major difficulty. Going to the fiscal, you pointed out quite clearly, uh, you know, overall we had fiscal policy response uh, uh, in all, all over the universe, not only of advanced economies, but also uh, emerging markets and, 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 and some developing countries, but with a huge difference in terms of scope and size. Just to give an idea, according to the estimates uh, at the IMF uh, last October, the combined fiscal and monetary stimulus, including guarantees and so on, of the advanced economies reached something like 20% of their GDP. Whereas in the case of the emerging markets and developing economies, on average, it was something in between six and 7%. In the case of Sub-Saharan Africa, for instance, the average was 3% of GDP. So that's a, a, a huge uh, difference in terms of magnitude. And among the emerging markets, also a discrepancy. Brazil took an approach uh, opposite to the one of Mexico. Mexico decided to bite the bullet uh, to, to, uh, to not do any major fiscal response. And, uh, and the fact is that the, the GDP in Mexico uh, will have decreased at the end of this year by close to 9%. Brazil, despite having uh, let's say, uh, a, a worse position in terms of fiscal uh, uh, stance, uh, a public debt high as a share of GDP, the option was 
to implement a humongous uh, money transfer program uh, that, uh, together with the downfall of the GDP, will take the public debt to GDP to something close to 94% this year, at the end of the year. Uh, <coughs> I'm sorry. On the other hand, GDP will decline half of what Mexico is facing, something close to 4.5% of GDP. It's a trade-off. The options were different. Uh, Mexico, let's say, ends the, the process in a, a better shape in terms of fiscal stance, uh, but Brazil avoided uh, to a large extent misery and, 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 uh, and, and the, the GDP downfall. Uh, the, this has been no problem this year to a large extent because these, the, the government, the treasury has resorted to very short term debt issuance. Also using the treasury account with the central bank. So, mm -hmm. but the downside is that there has been a shortening of the public debt and there will be a pile of debt to be renewed by April of next year. And everyone is hanging on, on, uh, on, on how, what will be the commitment by the government with the keeping the fiscal responsibility framework at place. I'm just writing a, a pub, uh, policy brief to the, uh, the policy center on this. Thank you. Thank you, Tadiano. Before going into that pile of debt that you just mentioned, Celestin, one thing that sort of like going back into this mix of the collective response of the central banks, but also how the, the line between monetary policy and fiscal policy is getting a bit blurred during COVID. For example, a number of central banks in, in Sub-Saharan Africa have been intervening heavily, quite heavily in the, in the real sector by, by supporting businesses, especially the, the, the small and medium enterprises, trying to avoid directly to, to fund fiscal deficits. So what's, is there a right balance? So what should be the right balance, especially for what's coming now? When, I mean, if the vaccine is rolled out all over the world in the next few months, what are we going to be left with? Well, thank you. Thank you. First, it's a pleasure really to be part of this conversation and to reconnect with old friends and, and, and one former boss. Exactly. Uh, uh, well, um, I'm not as uh, optimistic as uh, you are, Andres, in saying that uh, uh, African central banks have jumped in and done uh, everything they could to, to, to help uh, weather the shock of the pandemic. Um, it seems to me that um, uh, first, on the fiscal side, on the government side, uh, there was already very little fiscal space there, even before the pandemic. Um, as you know, unfortunately, most African countries, uh, Sub-Saharan African countries, but also North African uh, countries, um, are still um, uh, really dependent uh, mainly on commodity. And typically one major commodity. And you can build your economy uh, depending on one economy, uh, one, one commodity, one. well, you're gonna get in trouble um, at some point. And so even before the pandemic, you know, uh, there had been a decline in commodity prices uh, since 2014. Uh, okay. There was a small recovery uh, 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 going on, uh, uh, but, but then the pandemic came, came in. And uh, so governments already have very limited fiscal space, uh, of course. Uh, in most countries, the health sectors, um, uh, health expenditures are nowhere near they should be. Uh, not because there is a bias against health, but just because the country, the government have not been generating enough money. Uh, so that's, a, of course, there were some emergency measures here and there which were adopted, but certainly nothing near what is needed. And again, not necessarily because uh, the people running the countries are, are, are not doing their job, but so just because for decades, we have not built the kind of resilient economies, diversified economies that would generate 
the tax base uh, and the, 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 the financial power on the government side uh, to, to, to finance not just health, but also infrastructure, security, education, uh, communication. Uh, I mean, all, all these things that you need to be a modern economy. And then on the monetary side, on the central bank, picking special, especially the central bank, well, uh, some of them, indeed, especially in the part of the world where you are now, uh, mainly East Africa and a little bit in Southern Africa, there's been um, uh, some, some flexibility in terms of the policy. In North Africa too, uh, the central banks uh, have more tools uh, than, than, than in most, most other African countries. And here, if I speak in particular of Francophone Africa, which is West Africa and Central Africa mainly, well, unfortunately, um, the central banks there are very constrained because they are part of the monetary union, which leaves them very, very few tools, uh, even without any crisis, uh, let alone when there is a crisis. So to me, uh, this is uh, really an opportunity to rethink uh, seriously what fiscal policy should be, uh, what monetary policy should be in African countries, and not getting into the kind of mimetism uh, which uh, we have been trapped in for many decades, trying to copy almost blindly whatever uh, framework or institutional frameworks um, are in vogue, uh, mainly in Europe. Um, uh, and, and here, uh, I think that North African countries are, are, are good examples, uh, uh, especially for the Francophone African countries. I'm talking here about uh, Morocco or Tunisia, uh, despite all the political problems in Tunisia and so on. Uh, but um, at least in terms of uh, central banking um, uh, and, and the monetary strategy, the monetary policy, uh, they, have, they, are, they are really way away. And, and I pick them in particular because they used to be part of the Frank zone. You know, most, yeah, uh, yeah there are 14 African countries, the Francophone African countries, which are part of the Frank zone. Um, uh, West Africa, uh, which has a advantage, of course, in terms of low inflation, but also a lot of constraint. Uh, uh, and and um, I mentioned North African countries because they used to be part of that monetary union. People forget that. Morocco was part of the Frank zone. Algeria was part of the Frank zone. Tunisia was part of the Frank zone. Well, after independence, uh, they you know, went through a very rigorous thought process and they felt that because they are small open economies, they needed to you know, reclaim monetary policy to make sure that it is put at good use. And, and, and then they, they got out of the Frank zone and of course, they, they, they built a very strong relationship with the French economy, uh, but at least having uh, flexibility that uh, uh, West African countries and Central African countries do not have. So I think there is a lot of work to do there, both on the fiscal and, and on the monetary side. Before, so that was a very good point. Before jumping on to Karim again, do you think, because you mentioned the, the, the Central Bank Union of West Africa, but do you think in this particular crisis, we'll see the constraint or a help to belong to a monetary union? Well, it seems to me very clearly that uh, there were benefits and costs. The problem is, uh, do the benefit outweigh the cost? And I don't think that's the case. I think that, uh, uh, um, listen, when you are a small open economy, which is the case for all African countries, Really, all African countries. There are still small open economies. When you are a small open economy, the main engine for growth, for economic growth, has to be trade, external trade. Now, if you're a huge economy like Nigeria or Egypt or South Africa, well, you can have some leeway in terms of domestic uh, market. But you really need to get out of poverty. You really need to target uh, a foreign market and to be able to produce and export goods and services. And if that's the basic uh, fundamental, uh, well, you need to think carefully about your exchange rate policy. 
what would make you competitive. You cannot get trapped using um, a, a, a very a strong currency, which is the case, a currency for um, Francophone African countries, are basically using the euro, uh, which is called yeah. under another name. It's called the CFA franc. That is basically yeah. the euro because it's a fixed peg with the euro and they're part of the monetary union with uh, France. So they are using the euro. So they are getting the benefits of the euro because of that. Uh, but they've been getting these benefits for 60 years or so. Uh, but they are getting the cost of a very strong currency and almost automatic overvaluation of their currency. So it's very difficult to build an industry to have a robust trade performance if, you are main, if your currency is a very strong currency. So I think that the, it's urgent, it's been urgent for a very long time to rethink this monetary policy arrangement and not in terms of politics, whether they are against France or pro-France and so on. That's complete nonsense. And I mentioned Morocco or Tunisia earlier. Uh, Morocco did not become uh, against France when Morocco left the, the French zone. So I'm just thinking that uh, we need to think about monetary policy as a tool, as an economic tool, uh, uh, to ensure competitiveness when you're a small open economy. And you cannot use monetary policy as a political tool to organize some kind of political union. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Karim, uh, one recurring theme now seems to be the fiscal space. So, I mean, let's compare Latin America and Africa vis-a-vis for a second. I mean, you have Latin America is being crushed. So you have, for example, economies like Peru, they're really going to struggle and they're really going to tank. And on this side of the Atlantic, you're going to have Ethiopia, who's going to do relatively well. But across the board, it seems that growth aside, that the fiscal space is shrinking everywhere. So what's to be done? Oh. <laughs> what has been done and what's to be done? True. I mean, uh, of course, initial conditions uh, matter, you know, when the crisis hits where you are in terms of, you say, sustainable macroeconomic policy, and it includes a sustainable, uh, you know, fiscal policy and deficit. Uh, matter so uh, it was mentioned by Celestin and uh, and also uh, Ottaviano. So it depends uh, how 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 your position initially, and then the space that you have for expansionary fiscal policy or to compensate, uh, you know, in terms basically of social safety net, but also to create backstop and support uh, support for. Uh, for small and medium-sized enterprises. Uh, and so I can tell you that uh, some countries being very hard for some countries, some are under IMF programs, they've just entered IMF programs. So, uh, and of course it means, it, it, it still means a lot, you know, uh, sound macroeconomic policy, sound fiscal policy, despite very low rates, people tend to forget about that. At some point, you have to roll over this date. And it was mentioned by Ottaviano, and you cannot roll over all the time at the same interest rate. At some point, interest rate will increase. Yeah. And then you'll have to roll over at a higher rate. So we don't know many ways to shrink the deficit. Either you increase taxes, either you, you lower expenditure. At some point, you will be faced with that choice, which has an impact on the capital stock. And again, the capital stock is fundamental for productivity. And the, and the, the quality of the investment of this capital stock, the maintenance of it, et cetera, uh, is for developing countries a central issue. The quality, the composition of public investment is a central component of any growth strategy for a country on the continent. And it has, this is where you get productivity. Of course, I don't get into education and other factors. So what I want to say is that two things. First, on the coordination between fiscal and monetary policy, I think this crisis has shown, if it has to be shown, that a close coordination uh, you know, uh, while respecting the missions of both uh, policies is essential. There is a tendency of, you know, emerging fiscal dominance sort of back in the 70s a little bit because the treasury has the upper end in many countries given the sort of uh, dramatic situation 
And that could be, I would say, something we need to watch closely and to keep central bank independence remains very important. Uh, uh, at the same time, uh, we have to look very carefully at banks' behavior. We tend to focus a lot on monetary policy and the interest rate, uh, the, the, the central bank main tool, which is the, uh, the refinancing rate, it depends the Fed fund rates, etc. But what is important is the transmission mechanism of monetary policy impulse, impulse, impulse to the end game, which is the, a firm or a household, etc., which is the transmission mechanism which goes through banks. And banks don't necessarily uh, transmit the monetary policy or the orientation that you as a policymaker want. They are, you know, uh, aversion to risk, uh, portfolio arbitrage, uh, you know, reserves, etc. There are many uh, many uh, dimensions. So it is very important that they're different than the behavior of the savings, which is very different. So which is the dynamics are, are not the same. So I think we should look very carefully about bank behavior. Uh, we don't have a sophisticated financial sector as large with an imported market-based financial sector, which compete with the traditional banking sector in our economies. These are bank-centric, bank-dominated economies with small, where, where financial markets don't play an important role in terms of financing the firms, et cetera. Capital markets remain small. So bank behavior is fundamental. The coordination between fiscal and monetary policy while being careful at with the financial uh, dom uh, fiscal dominance. The third point is about the exchange rate. It was mentioned uh, by, uh, by Celestin. Uh, a country like Morocco uh, that uh, you know, has its own uh, monetary policy, of course, uh, within uh, you know, a sort of a, a semi-open uh, capital account. Uh, it's fully open on the current account, but uh, there are restrictions for investment abroad by, uh, uh, by uh, um, uh, for you know domestic agents. So the interest rate uh, parity doesn't play necessarily. You have no arbitrage between uh, forex and domestic currency. So that gives you space for the monetary policy to do even more. So I'm going into your direction, Celesta. It means that you have more autonomy for your monetary policy. You're not falling within the triangle of incompatibility because your capital account is sort of, uh, you know, sort of tightly managed and, and sort of closed for residents. Uh, and I think if you look around, uh, except countries that have been facing sort of very strong ex uh, external uh, pressures of depleting uh, reserves, uh, I don't see many countries actively using the exchange rate within that, uh, uh, you know, uh, over the past uh, the past year since COVID has been hit. And hit. But I think for a good reason, uh, I don't think demand is there. Let's take, you know, Morocco, if you depreciate, okay, you, 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 you sort of contract a little bit the imports uh, and you, uh, you expect a response on your export. But at the same time, demand was depressed all around the world. So I'm not sure it would, uh, would have worked, although I, I, I join you on the sort of uh, structural direction of having a, an autonomous monetary uh, exchange rate policy, which is mainly, in most of the case, I think my friends will agree, but it's a question for them, the main tool of the monetary policy for an, a, an African country, more than the interest rate itself, that has, you know, because of sort of sticky, imperfect transmission mechanism through uh, through the banking sector and due to uh, to, uh, uh, to to bank behavior. So, in a nutshell, I think, uh, Andres, what is important, fiscal policy. We we come back to a very basic message. You have to be uh, to save in good times to be able to spend in bad times. Bad Country time. where in a weak position when the crisis hit had met lots of difficulty to face with the, to the, the crisis. And you need to prepare and to work on your monetary policy. And that means establishing credibility that you can spend in bad time. 
It's because you have credibility accumulated in good times that economic agents will believe that you have a sustainable monetary policy and that inflation will not skyrocket uh, you know, very soon, that you are able to engage in some sort of unorthodox uh, policies, you know, be it depreciation of the exchange rate, be it you know, sort of quantitative easing of the like, uh, that you can venture into that. So you need established credibility. And it takes time to establish credibility and the trust uh, and to anchor expectations of economic agents. And I think that's what we've been doing in a way uh, in uh, in Morocco, but in other countries around. I think Ghana is another example at some point in time. And uh, uh, I think you, you were mentioning the Frank Zone. Maybe there's excess credibility in a way of being sort of hawkish <laughs> In, in controlling inflation. And that it is an asset for me. It is an opportunity to be spent in difficult times because you can guide economic agents. You can do things you will not be able because people trust you uh, that you will be credible and you will remain, you know, your policies will remain sustainable. So I think it's a very complex issue that has uh, uh, many moving piece and the, and the coordination, the message from the monetary policy authority, the fiscal ministry of finance, the notion of credibility accumulated is fundamental, and the notion of fiscal space that you create during bad times, uh, good times, sorry, and that can spend in bad times is very important. And I think this is the kind of messages that should be, uh, uh, in my sense, sort of uh, put in the uh, in the debate uh, within our countries. Thank you, Karim. And before jumping on to Otaviano, one uh, reminder to our listeners, uh, you can start asking questions by uh, the live chat of Facebook and YouTube, and then we will address them, or the speakers will address them during the Q&A. But Otaviano, on Karim's point about credibility and saving in, in during the times of, 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 this, of, of, of fat cows to spend on the dust of famine, uh, Brazil has been quite a guinea pig now on this fiscal, non-fiscal doom flee cliff. So at first they said, okay, last year it was they were obsessed with the pension reform to save a lot of money. Whatever they save now, they spent it in what they call the Corona voucher, which is essentially a cash transfer for those that were suffering the most economic hardship for the pandemic. But president, the president of Brazil decided to keep it, to extend it for a bit more because it was underpinning his popularity. How much can that affect? And this is an example to any country in the developing world. So how much can that affect? Number one, how can this reset the clock of the Brazilian fiscal ticking bomb? And how much that affect that credibility that Karim was talking about? Look, Andres, uh, well, keep in mind the difference the, uh, that the, the, the Corona voucher was one shot, right? Big, large, equivalent to the savings of, uh, of, of the, with the pension reform uh, during some time, but it's, it's one shot. Uh, there is uh, a m a much of a talk of uh, extending of uh, uh, making a, a large income transfer program uh, based on the, the, the conditional cash transfer that exists, which is tiny, it's 0.5% uh, of GDP, but with a, a, a great impact, a, a good cost effectiveness. So there are some now who would like to see it uh, extended, uh, so it's impossible to repeat the Corona voucher. This is beyond any doubt. Uh, it was one shot, but not necessarily would have to return only to the existing conditional cash transfer. Uh, the World Bank, uh, in a in a in a report made for Brazil two years ago, uh, pinpointed the possibility of amalgamating, putting together a series of uh, of uh, social transfer programs which are not necessarily as effective as the conditional cash transfer. And, uh, and that would allow, uh, let's say, to have a, a larger program reaching many of the informal people, the invisible people that uh, were included this year in the Corona voucher without necessarily jeopardizing the, the existing spending cap. What matters is the preservation of the spending cap because that's the way out of the fiscal 
uh, problems of Brazil. It's mandated by the constitution for 10 years. Uh, two important points, if I may. We have, uh, we have good examples in Latin America of uh, the kind of a rule-based fiscal policy that you mentioned. You, you have Chile. Uh, and, and to a large extent as well, Peru and Colombia are, have enjoyed a payoff in terms of, uh, of uh, better preparedness to, to implement fiscal policy uh, uh, because of the good behavior, macroeconomically speaking, of the last few years. So we have this difference. And the, uh, uh, another point I'd like to make is the following. We do have a problem uh, with the debt levels of many low income countries. The pandemic uh, put some of them, many of them maybe, uh, to, to beyond the uh, threshold of uh, insolvency, not only illiquidity, but also insolvency. And, but it's tricky because while on the one hand, the IMF and, uh, and everybody else is pushing these countries to, to, to go uh, and, and, and do some debt restructuring. Uh, fact is that some of them also are trying to avoid that because that's not, uh, that's not for free, that has cost and so on. But uh, let's keep in mind that we already have six Known advanced economies this year uh, defaulting and and restructuring debt: Argentina, Belize, Ecuador, Lebanon, Suriname, and now Zambia. So the uh, the issue of debt solvency is is another one to keep on the picture. I think no, you left. I mean, you before you refer to the pile of debt, so. I think that's 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 a key question to understand now. So, how much debt distress is coming, and what should be done about it? I was a couple of weeks ago. I was talking to 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 the finance minister of a of uh, an, an, a country in Latin America, and then he said, "Well, we may need a sort of like a new Brady plan, but a very fast one, because otherwise we're going to have the troubles." So, but so, what do you think? What's what's coming, or what especially what can be done about? It? Especially, I mean, we saw Zambia. As, as, as Otaviano was saying, I mean, Ecuador was saved by the bell at the last minute, but also is in a very tricky position and Argentina could blow up any minute. Well, uh, that's an important question. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll try to address it. But before that, I wanted to take a few seconds and, and respond to uh, Karim's uh, earlier comment uh, and, and challenge my good friend Karim a little bit. Um, he's a brilliant central banker, but he's a so we should be careful. <laughs> um, oh, not anymore, no, not anymore. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, no, uh, I mean, I want to come back to what you said about the Frank zone, uh, because you made uh, some strong points there by stressing what you consider the credibility. Well, um, people who live in these countries uh, have been told this for um, 60 years or more. Uh, the French zone was officially created in 1945. So that was even before this country became independent. Um, in fact, the, the, the zone was created in 1939, but it was officially created as such in 1945 under colonialism. And then in 1960, after independence of these uh, West African and Francophone African countries, uh, the same uh, treaties and agreements were just renewed. So it's been around for a very, very long time. I mean, we have more than enough evidence uh, to see what works and what doesn't work. So when you mention credibility, I'm talking in Agadu or in Bangui or in Brazzaville, you must be wondering uh, uh, where it is that credibility uh, beyond the macro. I mean, the short-term macro accounting that the Minister of Finance can, can grab about on television. Um, it's, it's impossible. Uh, let me say this very, I mean, not at all in a polemical way, but it is impossible uh, to build an industry, uh, a competitive industry with a very strong currency. This is not a political point, it's just a fact, okay? Um, there was a study done by um, somebody here at Harvard who unfortunately passed away, Professor James Dusenberg, uh, a legendary economist. He looked at every single economy in the world uh, for, for decades 
and he was looking at um, whether there was a single country in the world that was uh, using a fixed exchange rate and which grew for 20 years. He couldn't find a single one. It just is possible when you are a small open economy to have a fixed exchange rate and grow at 5% or more for 20 years. So it's impossible. So that credibility is um, um, on paper. Uh, because, and the evidence for this is that uh, non CFA countries in Africa, you know, all these Anglophone countries like Kenya, like uh, of course Nigeria, but also countries like Angola, they are attracting more foreign investment than the Francophone countries. So they have, they have higher inflation, but they have more credibility vis a vis the foreign investors. So foreign investors are not looking for uh, some fixed exchange rate on paper. They are looking for business opportunities. And with a fixed exchange rate, it's just very difficult uh, to build uh, a, a, an economy where you have industries and when you have, uh, you don't have jobs, you don't have, I mean, you have poverty and so on. So I just want to say that. But going quickly to the big question uh, that Andres has asked about the debt. Well, yes, it's a problem. But uh, let me say this uh, high debt is a global concern. Okay? And let me give you uh, the numbers so that you all understand the big picture. Well, for this year, in December of 2020, we speak uh, total debt in the world has risen to 277 trillion dollars. 277 trillion dollars. Total global debt for the entire planet. Okay? And African part is less than one percent less than one percent okay and uh, Africa's, you know contribution to global gdp is two three percent so if our contribution to gdp is two three percent but we only have less than one percent of global debt i don't think that africa's debt is threatening the world economy so let's just put, put that there now uh we need to be very clear uh, many african countries are facing serious debt issues because their economies uh, are held hostage by their own wrong strategies. If you build your economy of oil or gas or cocoa or coffee or any commodity or copper, uh, well, uh, and for 60 years, you can get in trouble. So they are in trouble. And the, the reason for, for the debt thing, um, uh, first is commodity trap been there for a long time. Of course, the pandemic this year, uh, so something that people don't talk about, which is the cost of security expenditure, okay? Bad policy decision, bad political decision, sometimes made outside of Africa, have created problems in Africa, okay? Yeah. Uh, Africa, uh, I mean, what happened in India has spilled over into several problems in most of Sahelian Africa. And, and, and I've identified about 15 15 to 18 countries in Africa, which have decided uh, to spend a lot of money into security expenditure. And some countries like that, which is on the list, would spend nearly half of the total budget on expenditure. How can you do that and not say uh, debt issues? We still have finance, infrastructure, health, uh, all kinds of things. So the costly security expenditure is a major issue, uh, a major driver of debt in addition to. Uh, to, to, to uh, commodity prices. Uh, some countries have faced sanctions, um, political sanctions, uh, you know, for good or bad reason, I don't know. But Burundi, Sudan, Zimbabwe, if you look at this country, they had no debt issues until they faced political sanctions. And then that created huge debt. Nobody ever talks about it. Well, we need to be honest when we have this debt. What are the drivers of the debt? Um, natural disaster. Well, we need to bring that to the picture. Morocco, where Karim is uh, at this moment, has suffered drought. Just like uh, uh, Malawi, Zambia, Zimbabwe, many others. Okay? Other countries have suffered flood. Mozambique, Burundi, Ethiopia, Uganda, Kenya, Somalia, and so on and so on. And guess what? Well, sanctions are coming up, but these natural events are caused by climate change. And Africa is the continent which has contributed to the 
is for climate change. When we are suffering, we need to suffer. And then we have to do that. Nobody talks about it. Uh, well, macroeconomics is not witchcraft. We need to be honest about uh, where, where the shocks are coming. And of course, lastly, uh, um, the infrastructure needs on the continent. Okay? Uh, every single African country has huge infrastructure needs. And when you put into that equation, the demographic uh, is your, and there's a need for public services, well, we need that. Uh, we need that. Now, the problem is, what have we done with the debt? How did it come about? Uh, what, and, and Karim posed a very, very important question earlier when he started talking. The key is what you do with the money when, when you get into debt. And that's something that we discuss and, and, and we haven't used it very well. So uh, very quickly, let me, if you allow me another 10 seconds or so, uh, to, to, to throw in there a couple of ideas into what you do. First, I think we need to reflect on the analytical framework to assess the debt. I think that the current debt sustainability analysis frameworks, which are used by the international communities, are not good. Um, I'm not saying this again, trying to, trying, to, trying to be political. I was involved in this. I'm a proud former world banker. I worked there for 23 years. And uh, I think that I led and I presented to the board of the World Bank and IMF the very first big initiative uh, in, in July. Uh, June of 2000. So I, 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 I'm not you know, uh, criticizing the World Bank and the IMF here, but I'm telling you that uh, their framework is wrong. It's not working. It's not really assessing the debt. We need to have a global workshop conversation on what is the right framework for assessing debt uh, sustainability in the context of these countries, especially given some of the drivers of debt but earlier that never hear from the World Bank or the IMF because they are just not focusing on that. Uh, I can talk a lot more about how to finance debt, uh, how to finance the European Union uh, without creating debt, the non-finance debt instrument, uh, the PPPs, uh, the blended finance, the enhanced credit, all kind of various tools that we can think about, that we can really use uh, with the other. Of course, we need to be serious about governance and corruption. You get into debt, but uh, you're not doing much in terms of corruption, and your own money is being deposited abroad. There are trillions of dollars from African countries which are currently deposited abroad, including government money, which is deposited abroad, and earning negative. Uh, so your own money is deposited abroad and earning negative return while you're getting into uh, high cost, and it's not clear what is going on. So that is the issue of transparency and so on that we can get into, but we may deserve that Karim and his team organize uh, a, a special meeting on this conversation. Sorry, I've been too long. Uh, too, <laughs> exciting no, no, no. If I may, Andres, uh, quickly, yes. uh, we, we are aligned, uh, Celestin, on the role of the exchange rate in the long run. Uh, as a, as a absorber, uh, absorber of shocks and uh, making sure that you don't appreciate it, you don't have long period of over appreciation, it's a catastrophe for economies, that's for sure, uh, as it also uh, tend to skew, uh, you know, the economy toward the trade, tradable versus non-tradable, toward, uh, you know, imports versus export, and it also screw sort of uh, creates uh, creates distortion in the rates of returns of uh, you know in the uh, in various sectors. So we agree on that. I was mentioning in the short term macro policy. I think you will agree with me in excess maybe, but the the, the Francais FA zone has gained a sort of uh, its credential in terms of being a, against inflation and being very orthodox and monetary, which you could spend in a situation like that, in a way, 
as credibility. I agree also with you that is a different discussion, which is very interesting, and we could do another round about long-term structural issues and growth strategy that you are mentioning about, you know, of course, the provision of health, education, uh, infrastructure. There's also a discussion very interesting at the global level which is linked actually to the low interest rate environment we're living in. The rates of returns are in Africa. If we correct, if we find a mechanism to de-risk this investment in a way to, to transform it in the language that is understood by financial markets, they don't have time to, to understand the nitty gritties of our economies, but a sort of platform that will digest and transform investments with high rates of return. Imagine the average rate in Africa in normal times is six, seven. Where do you find that? That's GDP in some sectors is 20, 15 just because of the demographic dynamics, you know, catching up, convergence, et cetera. In Europe, where it's, uh, you know, aging population, basically it's your population growth rate, more or less, you know, 1% potential growth in Europe, you know, in France a little bit higher because they have the, you know, dynamic uh, uh, fertility and, uh, uh, you know, rates of birth, but others is below one, Germany, you know, barely above one. So that's a very interesting discussion. It is maybe the opportunity this COVID, you know, to rethink international financial institutions in the way you're mentioning, uh, Celesta. I tend to say, yes, uh, it's about time to find something that will allow this to happen. Two fantastic opportunities in the world, Africa and the greening of our economies. Two fantastic, uh, you know, sources of projects of growth, as you mentioned, investors, they want projects uh, with positive rates of returns that could be financed in a very low interest rate environment all around the world where important rates of return. Uh, uh, the problem is, of course, to bridge the gap in the short term for many of our countries, you know, because they're not getting this inflow of money. Uh, you know, massive inflow of money. Uh, and still, I tend to, 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 to think, Celestin, based on my discussions with investors in, in Morocco, you know that we've been quite successful. We attract, over the last 15 years, about three percentage points of GDP, slightly less, uh, in net terms of foreign direct investment, which is quite high. It will maybe between 2.7, 2.8. Uh, one of the important criteria as we surveyed those uh, investors is the stability of the exchange rate. Uh, it doesn't mean an overvalued exchange rate. People tend to confuse, but a stable sort of predictable, uh, which makes sense, aligned with the fundamental of the economy. So it means not too many manipulations at the same time, not using it as a permanent tool to depreciate, et cetera. Otherwise, there are two, two, two sides of this, uh, of course, you know that very well. Of this coin, uh, you know, inflation, etc. So, but it's it remains, it remains. It's a central variable. I agree with you uh, for both uh, domestic and you know investors and, and domestic economy and foreign investors. So, sorry for I've been been too long, but it's a fascinating debate, uh, and I think we will come back on this issue. We'll take upon your suggestion. We'll do another round on uh, on those more structural, long-term growth. Uh, issues and another one maybe of international finance and what it means in the 21st century for the benefit of Africa, something of the like. No, I think structural issues, structural issues are key. I mean, Celestine, you you mentioned a couple that you, they may not be structural to many people in their minds, but things are getting worse. I mean, you saw the floods in Sudan, for example, you raised climate change. You were talking about security. Security in the Horn of Africa is not ideal at the moment, as you all know, the agenda is held. So these are issues that are going to drive on and on and on and probably are going to deteriorate for a long time. So I think this, this ties up to, to my next question, I want to, which is going to be the last before jumping on to questions. And I'm going to jump first to Ottaviano, but I think it's going to be the same question to the three of you guys. I mean, there is the cliche of the mantra that crises are opportunities, but is this, and then we go back into the structural changes, is this a time of very low interest rates in emerging markets, which is probably going to affect asset prices in the next few months? Is this the time for governments to take seriously reforms? So not talk about reforms. Is this the time to actually make and implement the reforms, Otaviana? 
Uh, yes, particularly some of them. Look, uh, it's, it's become clear that a legacy, a positive legacy, uh, we can find one uh, of the coronavirus crisis uh, has been the perception, the widely perceived need of boosting, enhancing, strengthening social protection systems. Uh, think of the US, the US doesn't have universal access to health, but definitely uh, there's going to be a push in the new administration toward doing something either uh, not Obamacare, but uh, and the same thing in Brazil and in Africa. So uh, we uh, a lesson learned uh, was the, the necessity of having appropriate registries. Uh, the the uh, uh, in the whole Africa, for instance, you know, you have to have you have to have to prioritize this, uh, particularly given the degree of informality in market. Uh, uh, in the case of Brazil, forty five percent of the labor force uh, operates under informal conditions. In in some countries in Africa, it reaches ninety percent. So. A legacy definitely is on the social policy side. There will certainly be as well uh, uh, the need, uh, Karim appropriately mentioned, uh, to reforms to make possible uh, lifting investments. The 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 uh, the need that was there uh, will be has been led to the roof, and we can combine. Uh, the reforms to make possible the private participation, for instance, in infrastructure investments, something to be combined with the green recovery. Let's be uh, let's be realistic. Uh, the the upside does not compensate for the downside, which has been the crisis. But there is some silver lining, indeed, in terms of a, a drive perception of the need for reforms. Thank you, Taviano. Two minutes each because we have to jump to questions. So let's turn. Is this time for reforms and which reforms? Uh, well, uh, I'm an economist, so I will say it depends. <laughs> yeah. It's time for reform um, uh, uh, in terms of the big mistakes uh, in public policies, um, uh, but uh, uh, not uh, in reforms that would uh, hit uh, uh, the poor and the people. Uh, when somebody is already suffering, you don't need to hit the person uh, in the head. Um, 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 I think that the pandemic this year has uh, shown vulnerability uh, for everyone. Uh, I think that it has, in some ways, democratized suffering. Uh, <laughs> I've seen uh, uh, rich countries suffering like uh, Burundi, and uh, uh, it was interesting then that all the ideological barriers that people always you know, come up with disappear. You know, for years, you hear all countries say, oh, we don't have money, or oh, we don't have fiscal space, all this and that. And then the pandemic comes in, in a few weeks, you have $12 trillion, which are spent by advanced economies just like that. So they can find $12 trillion um, in a few weeks. Um, I think that uh, if 5% uh, of that money were, de were devoted to uh, financing productive infrastructure, the one with positive uh, rate of return uh, in, in places uh, in Africa or elsewhere in the developing world, that would create win-wins uh, for everybody. Uh, that would generate growth in these places in Africa and elsewhere, uh, employment. And then because uh, uh, this country would have to import uh, capital goods uh, from rich countries, that would also create jobs in, in rich countries. And then you make a, a, a more stable world. I, I don't think that anybody is safe when Africa is not doing well, when every month uh, people go to Morocco, to Tunisia, across Africa, young people, and they want to die into the Mediterranean Sea because they're trying to find opportunities in Europe. If uh, you're talking about reforms uh, to create opportunities and help um, people create a new environment for growth and jobs, uh, uh, yes, uh, and, and of course, in terms of um, some of the things I said earlier, uh, to have a serious conversation on the monetary policy uh, framework and the institutional frameworks uh, that are in place, uh, the fiscal policy uh, uh, rules which are in place, usually enforced by the IMF, uh, uh, um, whether that makes sense or not, 
um, uh, the, the issues that uh, Karim discussed very eloquently earlier in terms of um, uh, uh, what works, what we need to keep, what we need to get rid of, uh, really with an open mind and with no ideological background, but focusing on the result. Yes. Karim, two minutes, time for reforms? Yeah, very quickly. Yes, time for reforms. It's always the time to reform, but by reform, I mean reflecting on what we do. Uh, and I would like, uh, you know, to uh, to uh, uh, to recommend our uh, audience to go and read uh, what Celestin and Achille Mbembe, his good friend, have written about feeding the mind, feeding the soul, nourrir les esprits in, fr in French. Uh, interesting contribution to uh, these are moment of distance, you know, of uh, looking at our ontologic security, looking at uh, being reflexive. I don't want to sound too philosophical, but uh, there is a bit of that in reform, you know. Reforming is about thinking to others, being benevolent, taking a step back and looking in your own society, how different components of society are faring, are doing. Uh, I think at the global level, it means looking at other parts of the world, being very mindful of the challenges, what is happening. And Celestin mentioned it, you know, we were all at the same sort of... Uh, level hitting by this crisis it means a lot you know it's a sort of the, it has a lot of mess. so so my sense is that any country needs to take this as an opportunity to rethink uh solidarity mechanism inclusivity the composition of budget you know they're highly political everywhere these are very complex institutions that are sort of the the network of tensions within society, and they're not sort of neutral as we tend to think us economists. They're, 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 <laughs> there's, you know, political institution by essence. So this is the message I take from uh, uh, from this. And the mess an important message is, uh, you know, La Cigale et la Fourmi, for, you know, the famous uh, <laughs> fable from La Fontaine, which is saving good times and spending bad times. So times. you have to be cautious and you have uh, to be wise and you have to be mindful of what you do. Uh, and I think it's both for countries internally, but also at the global level in forums such as the IMF, the World Bank, the G20, etc. Uh, it's a time for for sort of uh, sort of uh, a sort of quest for wisdom and, and more sort of human policies. And uh, but this is a bit far away, maybe from uh, macroeconomic policies. Well, thank you, Karim. But after all, we are all one of the things that this pandemic has has actually brought forward is that. It, it made us understand that we are all linked into a sort of chain of humanity. But so we are going to jump to questions. And I think, Otavion, I'm going to start with you because this one's tailor made for you. So, in such a context of monetary easing and structurally low interest rates, what should be done exactly so that the developed countries' global savings plot may be matched with emerging economies' investment needs as a win win transaction? Right. Uh, look at this. Yes, we have this. It's not a paradox, but uh, it's an enigma uh, associated to the fact that you do have a global savings glut in the sense that the levels of financial wealth in advanced economies are much beyond what can be the, uh, the channels that, uh, to absorb them uh, in the creation of new assets. So that's one of one of structural reason for uh, the long term low interest rates, and, and that's going to stay, it's likely to stay. Uh, while on the other side, we have this dire need of infrastructure investments, as uh, not only in advanced economies, but in most emerging markets and in developing economies. So why this doesn't happen, the channeling of such saving gluts to those investments? One major reason uh, is the complexity of the value chain of uh, uh, infrastructure investments in the sense that uh, from conception to, to operation, it entails a series of, uh, of risks, uh, different kinds of risks and so on, regarding which the, the, the financial intermediaries in the global economy do not necessarily feel comfortable to deal with. So the, the orientation in order to make the, a, a better matching would be, and it has been, 
uh, increasingly, multilateral institutions, for instance, or development banks, national development banks, or regional development banks, if you look at the value chain of the, the, uh, the infrastructure service, locate which are those risks regarding which the financial private investors do not feel comfortable with dealing with them, and then to provide it, a guarantee, uh, a provisional a credit guarantee, a provisional financing of this and that, that would make possible that sort of a commoditization of the, the infrastructure investment might make possible, might bridge the savings glut with the infrastructure investment needs in developing countries and emerging markets. Uh, there are many examples of how things uh, I could go on but uh, but definitely that's one way to help this the the the, uh, the the guys there who have their financial wealth that cannot get return uh, with uh, the needs uh, on the emerging market and developing countryside. Thank you, Otaviano. There's a question addressed to Celestin, but I'm sure Karim would just like to jump as well after what we see. So. Since the official launch of the, of the African Free Trade Agreement is in a few days, should African countries think of large monetary union to enhance the intra-African trade? And if this is the case, how can the African countries think of a sort of coordination in their fiscal policies as a way to avoid the problems that appear in the Euro area? I guess I have to no, 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 this is for you. <laughs> Difficult <laughs> questions are for you. <laughs> OK, well, uh, OK, let me uh, share my thoughts on this. First, I want to say that uh, the creation of a continental free trade area is a good thing. It's long overdue. I think that everything, every decision that helps take out the barriers to trade within Africa is a good thing. Um, a couple of years ago when I was uh, with the African Development Bank, we did a study which is available online, the 2018 African Economic Outlook Report. Uh, we were focused on that particular analysis. It's a free uh, download uh, in French and English uh, online, uh, 2018 African Economic Outlook. Just one sentence about it. Well, we uh, kind of showed empirically that uh, if African countries, all of them could simply currently remove the current bilateral barriers among themselves and then make the rules of origin, as they call them in trade, simple, uh, modest, and flexible, and then try to bring down you know, the non-trade measures uh, to the level of the most favored nation. They would probably, report, uh, uh, they'll probably gain about 4% of GDP uh, in benefits every year. Uh, so that's good. Now, the question uh, where I have a, a small issue with the question is that it then jumps into suggesting that Africa has a single currency or monetary union for Africa. It's a great idea, but it's an unrealistic idea at this stage. Okay? Um, it's very difficult uh, to make poor economies and poor countries. Um, who produce almost the same thing, uh, 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 have a monetary union that works. The condition for a monetary union to work and deliver results, good results, are not there yet. So if we jumped in doing a, a monetary union for Africa in 2020, 2021, it would be a political decision with no economic fundamentals. What works is creating economic opportunities, getting people to work in decent jobs, getting people uh, uh, to flourish, to increase their income, and then they become, they start trading among themselves, visiting themselves, and then um, monetary union and, and uh, political union comes naturally. That's what is going on in Asia. And I can tell you that probably 20 years from now, a lot of countries in Asia, 20, 30 years from now, uh, will, will be more integrated than Africa. They never talked about, you know, sitting down there and every six months and claiming that they're creating a monetary union. But they are focusing on what is important, developing industry, uh, giving education to people, building their economies, 
Look at what's going on in Vietnam today. It's a miracle what's going on in Vietnam. I'm not talking about the politics, but in terms of the economy. Um, every African policymaker should go to Vietnam. Uh, just again, not to stop it. But I need to see how they do it. Uh, and I can tell you if you keep doing what they do, just like China uh, and, and others, well, uh, they will naturally end up at some point in 30 years or so where um, naturally they trade more among themselves and it makes more sense at that time to have a monetary union. But you don't put the, the, the horse uh, uh, before the cart. Thank you, Celestin. Karim, you like metaphysics, so you will like this one. Uh, can we say that the current crisis has revealed that the strict discipline regarding macroeconomic balances, i.e. debt, budget deficit, has been advocated by the neoliberal doxa to excess? I don't think so. You know, I, I think, uh, based on my experience, but it's of course very partial and very uh, sort of, uh, you know, limited, my sense is that these are emp empirical questions in the end. Uh, 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 you know, this crisis, what has, has revealed, it has revealed that countries with a strong capacity to implement and deliver uh, were able to, <laughs> to sort of fare well. And Otaviano mentioned one thing, if you had a national registry of uh, poor people and poor households in your country and you were able to deliver cash transfer, quickly, efficiently, without too much leakage, leakage, you're in a good position, let's say, you know. If you had the fiscal space, uh, you know, before, you know, the crisis hit and to, you had to spend to support, uh, you know, households and firms, etc., you're in good position. So, uh, again, there are sort of law of gravity of the macroeconomic, uh, uh, you know, policies. You cannot accumulate debt endlessly. Uh, you cannot uh, sort of uh, lower rates endlessly. You will get inflation. You will get, uh, you know, unsustainable fiscal policy, end up in a, in a, in a crisis, uh, you know, in a debt crisis asking for foreign, uh, you know, support and IMF program. So I don't think this is a good way to ask the, uh, the, the question. Um, the liberal doxa for me is different. It's not in terms of the macroeconomic policy. It's more in the sort of uh, regulatory uh, institutions, uh, safety net, structural issues. That is sort of uh, what we call the Washington consensus, um, uh, where, where I think it's been questioned by other factors. It's been questioned by demand for protection for, from population, including in advanced economies, population and asking for protections for the state to deliver, you know, basic goods and protection in the health sector deliver. So there is a, uh, uh, they're asking for protection against the impact of globalization on the, the middle class for protecting the pensions, etc., uh, which I think is, uh, is a, is a very important issue that has to do with the nexus between globalization, inequality, and the emergence of populism around the world. So it's a much broader question than the macroeconomic policy, which is driven, I mean, my colleagues can, can, can correct me, but for me, by sort of laws of gravity, you know, there is a fundamental trade-off between inflation and growth, be, be, whether we like it or not. I mean, it's the basics of economics. There is something called uh, debt sustainability in the long run. Uh, uh, you can diverge from it, but there is also good, there are good and bad projects. You know, there are projects that have good rates of return that deliver for the population, and there are bad projects that are, you know, too expensive, inefficient, etc. So I think this is how I would I would frame it. You see, it's more. Uh, uh, sort of uh, what the crisis inspires me, and we look at these issues in a different angles at the policy center, which is, in a way, the return of the state. And there is a demand uh, from a different state, uh, rather than less state, if I want to be very brief, 
that is including in, the, in this question. Let's eliminate the state from everything. You know, education has to be private, health it has yeah. to be private, etc. Rather than the question on the macroeconomic uh, uh, policies and the balances, which more sort of, uh, if I want to translate it in common language, laws of gravitas, if you wish. So, you know, if I jump from this window, I'll fall. Basically, there is no other sort of, uh, uh, you know, choice, and unfortunately. Thank you very much, Karim. And I'm going to go to the to the last question, but it's the same for the three of you because actually it it it, it looks forward, so I like it. So two minutes each before we wrap up. So the UK started vaccination campaign this week. Countries are gearing up. Is access to the vaccine a boost? for economic growth, but also an obstacle for countries that do not have access to it? In case of new ways, would it be a factor of aggravating the inequalities between citizens and countries? Ottaviano, let's start with you, then Celestana, and we wrap up with Karim. Right, uh, definitely the whole thing of the coronavirus is uh, increasing the income disparity in the world. Uh, the, the outcome at the end of next year uh, is such that you know the income disparity among countries has been exacerbated, and and different access to 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 vaccine may make this worse. Given that the recovery in this place will depend on access to vaccine, we have seen some collaboration through the WHO uh, uh, proposal, but also we are watching right now a competition, a national competition. And inside a country, it's happening in Brazil. Uh, the Brazilian state of Sao Paulo uh, pushing for using the Chinese and uh, a, a vaccine produced in by Instituto Butantan, whereas the federal government has made a bet on another vaccine. And yeah, unfortunately, the inequality of access of uh, uh, to vaccines might generate uh, unequally in a, uh, the effect of increasing inequality within countries and and among countries. Thank you for having Thank me. Thank you. Thank you, Tavia. It's been great, Celestin. Vaccine well, uh, inequality I, coming? Uh, well, uh, I think that uh, Otaviano gave the technical response that uh, I could have uh, given uh, on the vaccine, so I agree with everything you said. Um, uh, let me just perhaps go beyond that and say that um, um, uh, uh, because I remember, uh, Andres, you asked uh, me the question earlier about the Brady plan. Does uh, the world need a new Brady plan? Nicholas Brady was the uh, Secretary of Treasury of uh, President Bush in '89 when he launched his plan, which basically said, well, um, Latin American countries or developing countries uh, have a debt issue. And uh, we have tried various ways of addressing this debt issue. It's not working. So we're going to find a way to kind of uh, restructure, forgive it, uh, or some of it, in exchange for them to do market-oriented reform. <laughs> that was the key. Well, I don't think we can do that today because we've done the market uh, reform already. Uh, I don't see any country in Africa where there's any market uh, reform left to do. Uh, yet. Um, we still don't have the results. Because, and I think that, so doing another graduate plan today under the same uh, condition would not may, make a lot of sense. Um, what we need today is to uh, step back and rethink uh, beyond ideologies, beyond preconceptions, and be pragmatic and look at what has worked uh, elsewhere, both in Latin America, in Europe, in Asia, um, and not to copy, but to see uh, uh, what uh, uh, other countries need to do. Um, there are, before the corona, uh, there, there were all the viruses in, the, uh, in Africa. I've, I've, read, I've read online somebody saying that the real problem that we're suffering now is a, a, a political corona, uh, a leadership corona. We have uh, many bad leaders. The proportion of bad leaders, on elected leaders, on accountable leaders, uh, people who strive in bad governance and who stay there and who are supported by the international community for decades. Uh, well, um, they are doing a lot of damage to, to these countries. And if uh, somebody could come up with an empirical way of counting the victims, yeah, probably we'll see that uh, 
the number of victims have been higher than the, the corona. Uh, so I don't want to trivialize the, 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 the big health crisis that we've had this year, but my suggestion is that we uh, bring this conversation to the next level, which is the quality of leadership and the quality of ideas which are put uh, into place when we discuss public policies. Thank you. Thank you, Celesta. Kerry, vaccine inequality, vaccine is gonna increase inequality or bridge the gap? You are on mute, Karim, I think. Karim, you're on mute. What, what I can tell you is that uh, His Majesty King uh, Mohammed VI here has just announced uh, yesterday that it will be free for all Moroccans. So uh, the state will finance uh, the vaccination. So domestically, there will not be inequality. Uh, at a global level, uh, there might be inequalities, but I don't think it, uh, uh, it, it will last because uh, there is, uh, you know, herd immunity and the, you know, people needs to be, if we want to have immunity, let us see. Uh, may, I want to conclude on public policies and what uh, Celestin ha has mentioned. In the end, uh, uh, every country needs to have a very sort of active and creative and uh, uh, sort of... Uh, uh, you know, space for thinking public policies. And I think uh, uh, this, is, this is essential. And uh, not, not just foresight, you know, and looking at the future, but really something where there's a permanent sort of uh, mechanism and dynamics of sort of uh, rethinking policies uh, for the domestic level. In every country, it is important. I think such Me mechanisms should also be created at a more global level. Uh, I don't think the quality of the dialogue, you know, and the and the sort of uh, uh, harnessing all the ideas and the brain power that Africa has uh, is at an optimal sort of uh, level. Uh, we could do much more together as Africans, uh, but also in relations with the rest of the world and, you know, global institutions. So, uh, in a nutshell, this is, uh, uh, these are, you know, it's a strong message in terms of uh, interdependence of societies and, uh, and of human beings all around the world uh, and the intrication and the complexity of the issues uh, that uh, we have to, to face. And that, in fact, uh, uh, and as it was our topic, the macroeconomic policies are, uh, remain, uh, you know, an important component and the capacity in every country to to have uh, you know, solid and good and sensible macroeconomic policies is important. Thank you very much, Karine. Thank you very much, Ottaviano. Thank you very much, Celestin. Thank you very much to the audience. Uh, Africa, so far has been, Africa so far has been spared the worst of Corona. Let's hope that remains the case. And as the great British comedian, the late British comedian, Albert Finney once said, uh, that the secret to riches is the same as the secret to comedy, and that is timing. So hopefully, Africa, your time is now. Thank you very much, everyone. Hola. Pleasure to be at the Policy Center. Thank you.